Good evening. Welcome to Washington Baptist Church tonight. We've got a good group here tonight, and we are in the midst of Bible school. So uh, we have a lot of action going on downstairs as Bible school just started. Dave was down there and did the opening number uh, for them, which is a fun time, I think, for Dave and the children for sure. So uh, be in prayer for Bible school. We've got uh, good numbers, and I think we're growing each night, I think, from what, what I've understood. And tonight is a special night at Bible school, and I'm going to try to put us on an express track as far as my message, because I need to be downstairs around 740 to present the gospel to the first group of our Bible school children. So I'm going to be done by 740 tonight uh, so I can be down there to share the gospel. But just be praying tonight as I present the gospel that the Holy Spirit moves, that children respond, that lives will be changed, if that be the Lord's will. Um, also, remember, Sam Camp is coming up in uh, the end of July, and if you want t-shirts for your children, uh, they need to be ordered by the 7th of July, which is not far away. And there's a sign-up sheet here on the Discipleship Bulletin Board outside these doors, or you can find Tony Arms and give her the size that you will need for your child. Um, also, the Limhi River Cowboy Church, we are still collecting. If you were not able to give last Wednesday night, you can still contribute to their ministry as we're trying to help them and support them in their outreach ministries of goat roping and um, outdoor camp Bible school, those kind of things. And so uh, we are still collecting money. If you want to give a check, you can make it out to Limhi River Cowboy Church, so it's going to go straight to them. And I also want to remind you about the conference we had last Sunday night uh, where we announced we are considering uh, hiring a full-time minister of youth. And so there is a job description out on the, in the vestibule uh, for you to look at and to pray over. And in the next conference in July, uh, we'll take questions and, and vote on that to see what you think. So if you have any questions about that a new position being a possibility, then you can speak to the personnel committee, to the youth pastor search committee or to the deacons and we'll answer any questions you may have about considering a full-time youth minister in the days ahead. I think that's our announcement. Oh, one other one. Our, our elevator, as far as I know, our new elevator right here at the end of this hallway is still not working. We've realized a part, we're going to have to order a part to get it working. So that elevator is not available and it most likely will not be available on Sunday morning. So we're going to try to get it fixed before Sunday morning. So I know a lot of you may park at the bottom and use that elevator to come up. So it was messed up this week at some point. We're doing our best to get it fixed. So you may want to find a different parking space Sunday morning if it's not fixed. So make you aware of that. Any other announcements tonight that we need to know about? All right. I will lead us in prayer. Father, we are thankful that we can enter your house tonight just to worship you. We thank you for what's going on in Vacation Bible School downstairs. I pray for every worker. We pray for the children that you are sending here. And I just pray tonight as I share your word that uh, your word will not return un unto us void as we know that you will use it for your will. So I pray that lives be changed, that your spirit move, that um, all the, the people involved just will be challenged and changed through this week at Washington Baptist Church by spending that time in your word. And I pray for us tonight as we meet and go through your word that we'll just be challenged and changed by your message and that you be with those we're going to look at in our prayer list that your will be done as we just seek healing in your direction. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just to add on to what Trent was saying, we will have two golf carts running. So they will pick you up and take you wherever you are parked to wherever you need to be. So we will have two golf carts running. Well, let's stand together as we sing, I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed 
and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in Him. But I know whom I had believed and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. Amen. You may be seated. I hope you picked up a prayer list tonight as we have them out in the vestibule. I don't think there are any up here. We do have our prayer letter, though, to sign. So if you are praying for these names, please sign the prayer letter so we can send that out and let these people know that we are indeed praying for them throughout the week. I'm on our prayer list. We have one right now in the hospital, and that is Mary Staten. As Mary went to have a stent put in today at the hospital, and she got a clear report. Things went well Um, But they had to keep her overnight just for observation. Uh, So she's doing well, but she'll be there overnight and hopefully will be home tomorrow. So keep Mary in your prayers. Uh, Brent Lindley also had surgery today. Brent uh, had shoulder surgery from a wreck he had a couple of weeks ago. And uh, things went well with it. It was outpatient, so he should be back home now. And uh, keep Donnie Clary in your prayers. She goes for surgery tomorrow at Spartanburg Regional to have that portion of her intestine taken out. So remember Donnie in prayer tomorrow for her surgery. And also on Friday, Larry Bridwell will be having hernia surgery. That was supposed to be uh, weeks ahead, but they moved it up, which is good for Larry. So that's an answer to prayer, I believe. So pray for Larry Friday as he undergoes his surgery. And then pray for Andy Wade and his family. Uh, He had an an MRI yesterday. He consulted with a doctor today, and the cancer is growing. And so they have decided just to stop chemo altogether. Um, They're now going to consult with his specialist in Winston-Salem to see maybe what they can do there with some experimental treatments. But for right now, it's at a standstill. So just pray for Andy, lift him up in prayer, and send him some encouragement. Uh, Tomorrow is his birthday. So you may want to reach out to him and wish him a happy birthday. So we're praying for Andy and Tammy and the family. Uh, James Pennington today. Dave and I stopped by Bayberry uh, today and uh, did a devotion. And uh, James said he is battling vertigo right now. So I know, and many people have been. So all of a sudden, vertigo is contagious. I don't know. It's, it's strange. But uh, So pray for James, and hopefully he'll feel better soon. And Paul White called me this afternoon. Paul fell out playing pickleball. Um, And if you don't know what pickleball is, I don't either. Um, But um, I've heard about it. Um, But he fell and hurt his shoulder. So he just knows that we are a praying church. And he wanted Washington praying for his shoulder that it's not severely injured. Um, And then also uh, continue to remember Jan Frazier. Now Jan's here tonight, but she's dealing with some health issues. So keep her in your prayers. And those who have lost loved ones. uh, Jake Klaus's funeral was today. He's a member of Appalach and his daughters are Rochelle Cox and Sonia Bradshaw. As that funeral was today, just remember them in prayer. And also uh, Donnie Pearson and his family, as his brother Tim passed away earlier this week. And that funeral will be tomorrow at Hillcrest Gardens at 11 o'clock. It'll be a graveside service uh, for Tim Pearson, Donnie Pearson's brother. And also Ed Rigsby's mother passed away. That funeral was on Sunday. So keep Ed and Debbie and that family in your prayers as well. Um, Diane Mangum had an echocardiogram uh, Tuesday, but she has not gotten results yet, but just keep Diane in your prayers. And Carolyn Dryden, her surgery is coming up on July the 5th for her surgery. And I was told tonight Jack Hollifield was not, not feeling well, so I know Jack's been in some difficult circumstances lately with things. So just pray for Jack, lift him up in prayer. And I've got one more to add to our church-related list. That's Melvin Duck. Melvin Duck. That is a relative of uh, Tommy and David Cobb, and he is on hospice 
at this point. So pray for that family. And of course, VBS going on downstairs tonight as the gospel is presented in a specific way. And if you'd like to help be a counselor, we are praying we're going to need counselors. We have some downstairs who are ready. But if you want to help, uh, you can come downstairs right after this around 740. And Melanie Hughes will kind of tell you what you'll need to do. But we just need people available if the children do have questions or to kind of explain to them if they have made a decision or not, and, and to walk them through the steps of salvation if need be. Are there any other prayer requests that need to be mentioned tonight? Yes, Debbie. Okay, so Debbie Collins' sister, Parkinson's. What was that? Jean, what was the last name? C-O-X, okay, Cox. Gene Cox. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, well, we will lift these needs up to the Lord in prayer, and I am thankful that we are a praying church and that we have a God to pray to who can answer every prayer in accordance with his will. Tonight, Lenny Moore, will you lead us in prayer for these? Well, if you'll turn with me to Exodus chapter 4, we have been going through a series with God sending Moses to Egypt to free the Hebrew slaves, and we're looking at the questions, concerns, and eventually excuses that Moses gives to the great I Am. So we started on the first night by just looking at the scene with the burning bush and what it tells us about God, that He is a holy God, that He is a personal God who knows us by name. And he does, in fact, send us on missions for his glory to, to let the world know who he is. And then we got to Moses' first question, where Moses said, Who am I to go to Egypt to do this? And, of course, God's response was, Certainly I will be with you. It didn't matter who Moses was. That Moses wasn't the one who was going to do the work. That God just wanted Moses to be available, to be obedient. And that God would be with him. With him. And then Moses' second question that we covered the last time we were here before Western night. He said, well, then who are you, right? Who do I say sent me when I get to Egypt? And that's where God gave his name, where he said, I am who I am. And then you have that word Yahweh, where he said, the Lord, L-O-R-D in all caps, the father of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he is again that personal covenant-keeping God. And then he tells Moses everything that will happen. You know, a lot of times we don't know what will happen. God doesn't usually give us the whole plan. But really here, God tells Moses step by step what to say to what people, how they will respond. And, and the hardness of Pharaoh's heart, the entire thing really, he walks him through. But Moses still isn't done with his questions. And, you know, I can't blame him. I think I would still have questions if I were in Moses' sandals and sent to Egypt at this point. But now we get to Moses' third question, 
which starts in chapter 4. So I'm going to read verses 1 to 9 of chapter 4 of Exodus. It says, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now put out your hand, and now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous, like snow. And he said, Put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again, and drew it out of his bosom, and behold, it was restored, like his other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river, and pour it on dry land, and the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. Now here Moses again questions God, well what if they don't believe me? What if I do go? And what if I say, the God of your fathers has sent me, the great I am, Yahweh, the Lord, has sent me here to free you. What if they say he has not appeared to you? You know, and I, I kind of think if we put ourselves in his sandals again, when God sends us on a mission, I do think this is a question we often ask or think. Is if God sends us to do something, I think sometimes my first response has been, well, what if they don't believe me? Right? What if they don't think I'm there for that? Or what if I, I'd speak, but nobody really responds or listens? But here, God says, I think that he understands the question. And God gives him three signs, three visible signs, manifestations of his power to show. And I want you to notice, it's for the people of Israel. These signs are not for the Egyptians. I think when I first read through this for years, I saw all these signs to Egypt. But it makes clear there in verse 5 that these are for the Israelites. They're for his people, not for the Egyptians. Now, if you go through this, you see that he does do these as well, I think, for the Egyptians. The thing with the snake, and, and Pharaoh sends out a snake, but of course, God's snake eats Pharaoh's snake. And then you have the Nile River turning to blood is the first plague that starts the series of plagues. And even with the, the skin disease, it's very similar to the boils that are covered by the, the people of Egypt. It's one of these plagues. So I, I think... They're also for Egypt to show the power, but right now these are for the people of Israel, God's people. And remember that God had told Moses when he goes there that the people will believe him. He had told him that back in chapter 3, verse 18, where he said there, if you go, they will listen and they will follow you. But here Moses still doubts. He's still not certain and he wants the people to know it is indeed God, and God answers that. And you see, when you get to chapter 4, verse 30, that it mentions there that Moses and Aaron go before the people, and they do these signs. So the people see these signs before he ever gets to Pharaoh, that God wants his people to know who he is. And that is, of course, the book of Exodus, where God is revealing who he is, his character, his power, and how to approach him. That's what he's doing here by letting them see his power. And of course, these three things, I think, are specific in what he wants Moses and the people to know about him. And I think we can learn from this tonight. So the first sign that he gives him involves his shepherd's rod, his shepherd's staff. You know, Moses says there, what if they don't believe me? And God says, what is that in your hand? And he says, well, that's my shepherd's staff, right? Moses had been a shepherd for 40 years after leaving Egypt, where he took care of his father-in-law's sheep. That was the tool he used as a shepherd. He's like, well, you know, it's my shepherd's staff. But God asked him to throw that down, and it becomes a snake. And, of course, it says there that Moses was in fear of that snake. It said he fled from it, which leads us to believe it's probably a poisonous snake. It didn't look like a snake. It was a snake. And you see the fear that, that Moses had. But then God says, reach out your hand and take that snake by the tail. 
Okay, now that would take some faith. You don't pick up a snake by the tail. First of all, you don't pick up a snake, right? <laughs> so um, my fear of snakes is just about equal to Travis's fear of snakes. Um, so I don't touch them, and I'm definitely not going to pick one up and not by the tail. But here Moses reaches down and he picks that snake up by the tail. And I think that shows that he is trusting this God. So he picks that snake up and it becomes the staff again in his hand. And as you look at this, I do think that there was symbolism in this for Egypt specifically. You know, that Egypt really worshipped the snake. That that was something they looked to as a symbol of wisdom or, or of power. Especially the cobra. You know, even the, the cobra, the snake, became a symbol of their pharaoh. Their king, ultimately their god, was kind of how Pharaoh is looked at. And we see that all through Egyptian artifacts, even with King Tut's mask that they found in the untouched tomb of King Tut. Is there on that mask, they have the cobra there out front of the, of the Pharaoh's mask that he would be buried in. It was, we think, on the, the Pharaoh's headgear was a portrayal of a, a snake. And the reason why is that snake was feared. It was deadly. It was dangerous. It would strike quickly. And so Egypt took that as a symbol of that Pharaoh's authority, that you don't mess with Egypt, you don't mess with Pharaoh. He's like a poisonous snake. Who would dare rouse Pharaoh or Egypt? They wanted Pharaoh and the Egypt to be feared, but what God is saying is they're nothing to fear when it comes to God Almighty. That you can just pick that snake up by the tail and I will control it. You have nothing to fear when you go to Egypt. Pharaoh has no power in front of a living God. That that power there is a symbol of Egypt, but of course the snake there was, but I think also it does connect us to that original old serpent, the enemy of us all in the garden. That that's who Egypt was really worshiping was Satan because they're not following the true God, but God is saying I will overpower not only Egypt but Satan. You have nothing to fear, Moses. I will control that serpent, Egypt, and Satan. And I love the fact in this that he just says to Moses, what's in your hand? Right? And it's, it's a shepherd's staff, something common and ordinary. It's not a magical stick that had any kind of powers. It's an ordinary, everyday piece of wood that he used to guide and protect sheep. And it tells us that God uses ordinary things. He can take any ordinary thing and use it for his glory and to get people to come to him if we're just obedient in doing it. You know, that, that rod, that staff, further through the Exodus story, is used to do some of those plagues where God speaks, speaks, let me try that again, speaks specifically and tells Moses to use his shepherd's rod, that staff, to perform that miracle where he parts the waters of the Red Sea with that staff uplifted to God, where he uses it to, to get water from the rock. That staff that was Moses' staff in his hand becomes known as the rod of God, the staff of God that weren't miracles. And I love that it was his shepherd's staff, something that was common to him that he used, that he was comfortable with, something that he used every single day for 40 years. And yet God's going to use that to bring power and to bring glory to God and to work these miracles. And I think it tells us that when God uses us, he doesn't want us to, to be something we're not. He just uses what's in our hands. That's the story there. And I've learned that in my walk, that, you know, often I try to be somebody I'm not, especially if I'm following people like Joe Price or Drew Hines, you know, and I try to think, well, I have to be like them, but I'm not them, you know, and, and whatever you get called to, you realize that I don't, God's not asking me to be somebody I'm not. He just wants what's in my hands and he'll use what, what he's gifted me with, whatever that is. You know, for David, it was a sling. For Paul, it was his zeal or even a pen to write Scripture. For that boy that the disciples came across, it was the loaves and the fishes that was in his hands that God multiplied. Whatever it is, all he says is, what's in your hand? Even if it's something common and ordinary, God will use it for his glory and for his kingdom if we're just obedient. Moses threw down that staff and he picked it back up because God told him to. You know, and I love that passage. I'll go off track here for a little bit. I love that passage because Scotty tells me she heard a sermon one time on this right before we started dating. And it was about throwing down your stick, whatever it was that you were holding on to and that God had told you to release. And she said that that night for her, it was dating. And she had apparently dated 
terrible guys. I don't know. Um, but she said, for me, it was dating. And I decided after hearing that sermon that I was going to throw that stick down. And I wasn't going to pick it back up until God told me to. And then here I am. And she decided to pick me up. So I guess that makes me the snake. You know, that's what I told her. I said, now, wait a minute. Looking at that. Anyway, I do love that passage, but that's another story. But think about what it meant, the symbol of, of a power of Egypt that God would control. Something as simple as what's in your hand God can use. But then the second miracle, starting in verse 6, where he says, Now put your hand into your bosom and pull it out, and it was leprous, covered in leprosy, a skin disease where it was white as snow. No, and then he puts it back into his, his bosom or his coat there and pulls it back out and it's healed, restored. No, leprosy was an incurable, infectious disease, very contagious. The people feared leprosy as much as anything. It was a deadly disease where your you know, extremities is where it starts, where your fingertips or your nose or your toes and your skin would literally just rot off and they would fall off. It was a hopeless condition. If you had leprosy, you were done. You were isolated, ostracized from everyone else. You were unclean in their society. It was something that they feared, something they couldn't control, that no one could tame. But yet God says, look at that hand that's covered in leprosy. And all he did was just put it back where God told him to and all of a sudden completely restored. That leprosy was really that death sentence. But what God is saying is, I can heal. I can control things you can. I can heal things that others can't. What's a death sentence to some, I can turn to life. I can bring ultimate change. You don't need to be afraid of whatever you go to when you go to Egypt. You don't need to be afraid of their armies or their chariots or their horses. They may have ruled over you for hundreds of years and you may have served them, but ultimately they will serve me as the living God. There's nothing to fear. Even leprosy does not stand a chance in front of this God. That it reminded Moses and let the people know that they worshipped a God who could heal and who could control, who could change from life to death, which was their situation in Egypt. Essentially to them it was like death, hopeless, slavery, with no way out, but now they had hope. But then you get to the third miracle, where he says there, if they don't listen to the one or to the other, then perform this third miracle, and from this they will then listen. And he says to take the water from the river. Now that, of course, is the Nile River. And you take that water from the river and you pour it there on the shore and it will be blood on the dry ground. Now think, you know, I, I taught world history for a while through my career. And the Nile River was Egypt. And they say if there's no Nile, there's no Egypt. The reason they were there was because it was their life source. Everything was built on the Nile River. They were dependent upon the Nile River. It was their food source with fish and, and things they could get from it. It was their water source for drinking or even for watering their crops and their society. It was their protection. If anyone tried to invade, they could, had to slow them down by going through the Nile River. It's their transportation and their trading things with other places. Everything came and surrounded through the Nile River. It was essentially their source of life. Essentially, it was even a god. They had multi-gods, they were polytheistic. And they even had a god that represented the Nile River. That was that god who brought life to them. That it was their source of life. But yet God says, I'm taking that source that you look to for your hope, for your strength, for your protection, for all that you need, your life source is now going to be blood. Your life will now be death, is how Egypt would look at that. And of course, the people of Israel who were there as slaves knew that. That they were, God was sending them a message of what he was going to do to Egypt. And of course, the Egyptians will see that in that first plague, as Moses will do this same plague to, to start the ten plagues. Because if you look at these three things, I think God picked these particularly for His people to know who He was. And I think that's the lesson really of this passage in Exodus, that this was not just about God getting His people out of Egypt. It was about His people learning who He was, who He is. That He was calling them to that land He had promised them. That He was that faithful God who would fulfill His promises. That he was saying, you follow Moses because Moses is your mediator. He is speaking for me. And I'm the God who fulfills promises, who can do all things. That he's teaching his people to follow him 
And as you go through the book of Exodus, that's what you see, that those plagues offer them deliverance, that he is the God who will deliver his people. And then you get to the Ten Commandments, where that is his law, and he is teaching them his character, that this is who I am, and if you follow me, this is who you are. And you have to be obedient to the law so that you represent me to the people. And then, of course, as you continue through Exodus, you get to the tabernacle. God's presence, that he is always with his presence, with his people. And it's a way to teach them how to approach this holy God and how to worship him. And, of course, all that is pointing forward to our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the fulfillment of every bit of that. Is our deliverer, the one who fulfilled the law, the one who's always with us, the living tabernacle, God in the flesh dwelling among us. But as I look at these three signs, here's, I think, the application for us tonight is three questions. First of all, what's in your hand? Right, That's what he asked Moses. What's in your hand? We've all been given some kind of gift or talent that God has blessed us with. Something that's natural to us that God has given you, and He wants to use it for His glory. You know, it could be a paintbrush or a baseball, a musical instrument, a microphone, a pencil if you're a writer, a hammer, a keyboard, a phone. It could be anything. Whatever's in your hand, something that you were born to do, something that He has gifted you with, give it to Him. Let Him use it. See what God will do with it. If God can take a wooden stick and use it to deliver his people through his power, think of what he could do with your gifts and talents and with you as his greatest creation, as humans made in his image. What's in your hand? Turn it over to God and let him use it. Second question, and this may sound weird, what is your leprosy? Now what I mean by that is, what thing are you really afraid of? What's something that you really fear, you say you can't control, that may seem like it's hopeless, that always seems to prevent you from doing something God may have called you to do? I think in a sense we all have that leprosy, whatever it is that strikes fear into us, that says I can't control that or it's something that I'm uncertain of. God can heal it. God will take away that. Whatever it is, it's not hopeless because God's the one who can restore Don't let that thing prevent you from serving God. And the third question is, what is your Nile River? What's the thing that you look to really as your source of hope or strength, whatever you have really looked to for your source of life instead of God? There may be something in each of our lives that really has become like the Nile River of Egypt to us. Something that maybe even has replaced God that we go to. And you take that and you remember that the God is the God over that. Make him that Lord who can control that. Know that he brings life in every situation, that he can use you in a mighty way. You know, when that mission comes, whatever God may call us on, I hope we don't say, well, what if they don't believe me? I hope we'll just say, whatever fear I have, whatever I've put before you, whatever's in my hands, I give to you, Lord. I know that you're with me, and I know you can do all things, more than we can even ask or imagine, through his power that's at work within us. I hope this has touched you tonight and worked in your heart, that we'll be ready to serve, knowing our God can do all things. And pray for me tonight as I leave now to go downstairs uh, to, to share the gospel with those children. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful for your word, that we know you are with us, that you have prepared us for whatever it is. You have equipped us for whatever it is, that whatever mission we have. And I pray that whatever's in our hands, we will turn over to you. That we know you can take something even ordinary to us, something common, and you can use it for your glory to reach people so that we can know you better, so that others can know you better. And I pray that we'll release all those fears and, and anxieties that we have over to you. That we'll see you as that giver of life, the source of of all life in our lives, that we'll give you the glory and that we'll share that glory with the people around us, that they'll come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you work tonight, that you just lead people to salvation through Jesus. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.